Good afternoon, Memorial Baptist friends and family, and welcome to our midweek edition of our podcast for December 9th, 2020. Uh, By the way, there are only two more weekends until Christmas. (laughs) I hope that each of you are having a great week. You know, last night on December the 8th, um, our deacons met and we had a great prayer time. A prayer time for one another and for our church and for those folks in need of a touch uh, from our master. Um, it was a Holy Spirit watering time of fellowship and unity, and it sure does my heart good uh, to get together with other godly men in unity and in fellowship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, we have a great group of deacons, and I am so delighted and and proud of each one of these men and the the commitment that they've made, not only to the Lord Jesus, but also to Memorial. And what a blessing it is as a pastor uh, to have a group of men like this willing to lock arms and and walk the journey with me. Uh, So what a blessing it is. Um, You know, this coming Sunday, December 13th, Dallas and Caitlin Holston will be with us. Dallas will be leading our worship time uh, in view of a call to ministry to come and serve at Memorial. We'll be having a special called business meeting to to vote on his call immediately following our morning service. God has been at work confirming his will for us uh, concerning the Holstons as well as confirming his will in their lives. And I hope that you will make every effort to attend and help us to welcome uh, the Holstons uh, to Memorial. You know, we will also be having our annual candlelight communion service on December the 20th at 6 p.m. This is always a great opportunity to partake in communion as a family, uh, as a unit. And uh, we enjoy the Christmas story through scripture, uh, through singing Christmas carols, and receiving communion. And I hope that you will make plans to attend uh, our communion service as well. Please pray for us as we continue to minister during these difficult times. Uh, I would ask that as we continue to gather for worship in person, I want to encourage everyone to uh, wear a mask, to social distance, and to make sure that we are following protocols as we try to protect our most vulnerable. You know, if you're not able to worship with us in person, please check out our new and improved live stream uh, on our NBC Temple YouTube channel that premieres at 10.45 a.m. on Sunday morning. Uh, This is a live feed, so you can watch our service online as it's happening in real time. Before we get into our scripture uh, today, uh, wrapping up Hebrews chapter 11, I would like for us to pray together, and I would ask if you would pray with me as I lead us in prayer. Loving Father, I thank you for the opportunity today to, uh, to share your word. And I ask, Father, that you would just be with our nation. I pray, Father, for um, our United States. I pray that you would preserve the union. I ask, Father, that you would just be with our leaders. I pray that you would turn their heads to you. And, Father, that they would honor you with all that they are. Father, we are in need of some godly leadership. So I pray that you would put godly leaders in power in in our nation. Father, that you would turn people's hearts back to you. Father, that you would show yourself mighty. Father, what you've done in the past, surely you can do that again. Father, you've done it before, so I say do it again, Father. Lord, I pray for a great revival. I ask, Father, that you would pour your Spirit out upon this country, upon our state, upon our churches, upon your people. Father, I ask that you would be uh, with our homebound members. Father, that in in these lonely hours, Father, that you would visit them, and Father, that you would they would sense your presence with them. 
I thank you, Father, for every one of our members, and I pray that you would bless them indeed. I'm asking, Father, for comfort for those who are hurting, those who are grieving, those who are mourning. Uh, I pray, Father, for your comfort, your mercy, and your grace. Father, I pray for those who are struggling with uh, COVID. I pray for healing for them. I ask, Father, that you would be with the families of those who cannot see their loved ones. I pray, Father, that you would just uh, visit them in their affliction. Father, I pray that you would touch their lives. Father, that you would bring healing to them. We know that you are more than able. Father, I ask for the light of your word uh, to be shed across this land. I pray, Father, for all of the, the churches and the pastors. I pray, Father, for a great awakening. I pray for a great revival. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, I ask that you would be with our neighbors. I just lift up <clears throat> excuse me, those that don't know you, that don't have a relationship with you. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would draw them to you. I pray, Father, for the souls of men and women who don't know you. I pray, Father, that you would draw them to yourself. Lord, I pray for the ministries of Memorial Baptist Church. I ask that you would guide those ministries. And Father, as we see people coming and (coughs) wanting to be a part of what you are doing, I pray, Father, that we would make a little more room at the table. Father, that we would open our hearts up to those seeking you. Father, I pray for our staff. I pray for um, those that that serve every week. Father, that, that are in the trenches, working with our children, working with our college students, working with our, our youth, and Father, working with our adult families, and Father, just those that are working in every area. I pray that you would just encourage them, and Father, that, that your Spirit would just continue to build them up and edify, and Father, that you would grow your church, um, not only in numbers, Father, but in depth. Father, that our discipleship, our commitment to you would be greater today than it was yesterday. Father, that you would just continue to build your church. Even as we see the day approaching when King Jesus returns, oh, Jesus, come quickly. But we recognize that in Until He returns, we continue to labor, toiling on, as the song says, toiling on. Father, I pray that You would be with our um, this coming year. The many things that You have uh, for us, I pray that we would embrace those and rise to the challenge of 2021. Father, that you would be glorified in everything that we say, think, and do. I pray for Dallas, and I pray for Caitlin as they come, Father, and and he leads in worship. And I pray, Father, that you would confirm your call in your people. And Father, that you would do that by your power for your glory. Lord, we are so blessed to be called your children. You lavish your blessings on us every single day. And for the meals that we eat, for the air that we breathe, breathe, for the relationships that we have, we give you thanks. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Almighty God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for the work that you do in our lives every single day. We love you. We praise you. Guide us as we study your word to know you better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we're going to be in Hebrews uh, chapter 11, verses 32 through 40. And we're going to be talking about the achievements of faith. You know, after multiple uh, studies from the 11th chapter of Hebrews, we've been here a while, uh, we will now finish this great chapter on faith. Um, The whole purpose of Hebrews 11 was a design by God to teach Christians uh, not to become discouraged in their Christian walks, but to persevere, to endure, and to press on for Jesus Christ. 
by faith, believing in the unseen God to work supernaturally uh, for them. As you remember, these Hebrew Christians to whom the author was writing this book were undergoing some very difficult social uh, persecution from the unsaved Jews. And consequently, many were discouraged and some were even thinking of giving up Christianity to go back into Judaism. The author of Hebrews calls the people to persevere and and encourages them to press on in Christ. You know, the author of Hebrews kind of sounds like a a preacher with his eye on the clock. (laughs) He could say far more if time allowed, but instead he simply lists a few names without comment and then describes the experiences of others without naming them. I mean, some won great victories by faith and others suffered horrible torture and death by faith while all of them gained approval or, you know, testimony. Um, Our word martyr comes from the Greek word. Um, By their faith, they did not receive the promise that we have received. See, the author is trying to strengthen his readers to be faithful to Christ, even in the face of pending persecution. His message is much needed because of the human tendency to use faith in Christ as the means of personal comfort and happiness. But when trials come, sometimes faith is abandoned. And his message is this, is that faith trusts God in spite of results looking to the final reward. I love that. Let's read together. Hebrews 11, verse 32 and following says this. It says, And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performing acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured, not accepting their release, so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings and, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Because God had provided something better for us, so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. See, it becomes obvious that these Old Testament believers did mighty acts for God by faith. They believed God, and God honored their faith. But sometimes they paid a tremendous price for what they believed. They were deprived of things, snatched from their families, thrown in prison, horribly tortured. Many were martyred because they believed in the one true God who promised the Messiah and His kingdom to come. See, no amount of suffering on earth would make them give up their faith. They were completely convinced of God's promise of heaven and their future resurrection to life. See, the world was not worthy of these Old Testament believers who trusted in God, but they were great because they had tremendous faith in the one true God. They persevered when they did not receive what was promised That is, they had not seen the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and His kingdom in earthly or eternal form. We who live in the New Testament age have a better grasp of God's plans and purposes 
than did the Old Testament saints. We now know that Messiah had to come and salvation was made available to all nations through his death and the church formed before God's eternal plans could be completed. The Old Testament saints could not be made perfect or whole or complete without the New Testament saints who form the body of Christ and anxiously await his second coming. See, not only Old Testament saints suffered for Christ, but New Testament Christians have all suffered greatly for their convictions concerning Christ who has come. In over 2,000 years of church history, Christians, hear me now, Christians have paid a great price to be faithful to the one true and living God as revealed in Jesus Christ. All of what we enjoy today as Christians in America, and we may not enjoy it much longer, is the result of true Christians who did mighty acts for God by faith and suffered and died rather than renounce Jesus Christ. See, I'm afraid that a generation of Christians has arose that knows nothing and cares nothing for its historical past. Reminds me of Judges chapter 2 verse 10 that says, And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which He has done for Israel. See, we must understand our Christian history and tell it to our people just as the Jews of old recounted their history to their children. Like it says in Psalm 44, 1, O God, we have heard with our ears, our fathers have told us the work that you did in their days, in the days of old. Let me recount a few of these for you. We think about the twelve apostles, did mighty acts for God, and they turned the, the first century world upside down for Jesus Christ. On the day of Pentecost, Peter preached and 3,000 souls were saved and baptized and with great perseverance, the apostles, they took the gospel as far as India and China. All the apostles died as martyrs except John. Peter refused to die in the same manner as his Lord, so they crucified him upside down. You know, the early Christians, they achieved great things for God because they had faith and they were willing to pay the price to follow Christ. Christians were crucified. They were fed to mad dogs. They were tied to bulls and dragged to death. They were burned at the stake. They were used as gladiators bait. And they were thrown to the lions. But they would not deny Jesus Christ as the only Savior of the world. You know, a good illustration is Polycarp, who was a disciple of the Apostle John. And Polycarp was arrested and brought into the amphitheater in Smyrna. You remember Smyrna from the book of Revelation, one of the seven churches? The amphitheater in Smyrna was filled with multitudes of people. And since there were no images of gods in the houses of worship of the Christians, the the heathen rightly concluded that the Christians did not believe in the existence of the little g-gods. And they accused him of being an atheist. The proconsul reminded Polycarp of his great age and urged him to show his penitence by joining in the cry, Away with the atheists! Then the proconsul said, Revile Christ and I will release you. But Polycarp answered this. He said, Eighty and six years I have served him, and he has never done me wrong. How can I blaspheme him, my king, who has saved me? I am a Christian. To the crowd, the proconsul then proclaimed, Polycarp has confessed himself to be a Christian. And the crowd yelled, let him be burned. About 150 years before the Reformation, fast forwarding, John Wycliffe 
A priest in the Roman Catholic Church denounced the Roman Church as Antichrist and declared the only head of the church to be Jesus Christ. Wycliffe then became a hunted man. He trained pastors, called Lollards, and smuggled Bibles into England so that almost every market town and hamlet in England had some kind of gospel witness. Wycliffe spent most of his time in hiding, for he was sentenced to death by the Roman Catholic Church. John Huss, who lived a hundred years before the Reformation, was a priest and became the head of the theological department at the University of Prague, which is now known as Slovakia. He was converted to Christ and spoke out against the Roman Church. He would not bow his knee to the Pope, and so he was condemned as a heretic. Huss's writings later had a great influence on Martin Luther. On the day of his martyrdom, Huss was dressed in full vestments of a priest. Then one by one, every article of clothing was stripped from him with lewd remarks made about him, and a paper cap was placed on his head which said, Here is the Hesiarch, the arch heretic the chief heretic. You know, when the darkness of superstition covered the earth, when popery sat on her throne and stretched her powers across the nations, God raised up Martin Luther in the 16th century. Luther came forth and preached the gospel of the grace of God and how the world trembled. It appeared that the Roman church would stand for another thousand years, but God had his servant the monk, Martin Luther, who believed God and laid an axe to Romanism. Luther was excommunicated from the Roman church, and upon receiving the excommunication paper from the Pope, he said, the Pope's decretals are the devil's (laughs) excretals. When he was summoned by the king and Pope to appear at the Diet of Worms, his friends pleaded with him not to go, but he said, If there were as many devils in worms as there are tiles on the roofs of houses, I would not fear. I will go. And at the Diet of Worms, Luther was told to recant his views or face certain death. He again replied, It is impossible for me to recant unless I am proved to be wrong by the testimony of Scripture. My conscience is bound to the Word of God. It is neither safe nor honest to act against one's conscience. Here I stand. God help me. I cannot do otherwise. Luther, from that time on, became the most wanted heretic by the Roman Church. Do you know about the Anabaptists? Those of the Reformation who were neither Lutheran nor Calvinists were Anabaptists. These people loved the Lord Jesus. They stood in some ways more firmly against Rome than any of the Reformers. It is true they were free will in theology and radicals, but they made a tremendous contribution to the Christian world. Their contribution was a biblical concept of the local church. The Anabaptists suffered terribly at the hands of the Roman Catholics and the Lutherans, but they would not deny their beliefs for anyone because they believed strongly in baptism by immersion. Many were martyred by drowning or by being burned alive. No one group of Christians then or now has all the truth, but each group has made a significant contribution to the whole of the church. You remember John Knox, who trained at John Calvin's school in Geneva. He led the Reformation in Scotland. He was able to have that small country throw off the yoke of Romanism, and from that land came the great evangelical and Presbyterian revivals. So godly was John Knox, the Roman Catholic Queen Mary, better known as Bloody Mary, for her persecution of the Protestants, said, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than I fear all the armies 
of Europe? Or what about Latimer and Ridley? After Protestantism had been established in England, various kings and queens tried to reestablish the Roman Church as the National Church of England. And during this time, two great bishops in the Church of England were put to death, bishops Ridley and Latimer. They were burned for denying what's called transubstantiation, where the bread and the wine turn into the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. As the flames curled around their bodies, Latimer spoke courage and comfort to his fellow martyrs. This day we shall light such a candle by God's grace that England, as I trust, shall never be put out. Have your fathers told you about John Bunyan? Once the Church of England had been securely made the National Church of England, they began to persecute Christians who did not bow to the Church of England. John Bunyan, a Baptist, was one of these. He was thrown into prison for 12 years. He was accused of preaching in the open air, and he insisted upon going out into the highways and byways to preach. And they said to him, If you you will promise not to preach in the open air, you can be released. And it was John Bunyan who replied, If you release me today, I'll have to preach in the fields tomorrow. It was John Bunyan who during these years in prison wrote the most famous Christian book, Pilgrim's Progress. Or what about George Whitfield, founder of Methodism? It wasn't John Wesley, as some suppose. Whitfield preached in a day when the Church of England as a whole was sleeping. They were slumbering. Irreligion was the rule of the day. The streets seemed to be full of iniquity and the gutters were full of sin. Whitfield left the security of a church pulpit and began to preach to thousands in the fields and the streets of England. The whole church of England turned against him and it was a a rare phenomenon to find a church pulpit that was open to him. As he preached, the power of God came upon people and one after another fell down smitten. It was not strange to see 3,000 people at at a time under Holy Spirit conviction when Whitfield preached. See, time fails me to tell of the Wesleys, the Jonathan Edwards, the Charles Spurgeon, the William Carey, David Livingston, John Patton, Hudson Taylor, D.L. Moody, Mockin, Warfield, Doss Trotman, Martin Lord Jones, Bill Bright, or even Billy Graham. See, these are but a few of the men of fame in Christian history. But what about the multiple millions of faithful saints who lived and died in obedience to Jesus Christ? In the 20th century, millions of Christians have suffered and died in many different areas of our world. People who have believed God have done mighty acts for God and achieved many spiritual works that have seemed humanly impossible. What great revivals have come because God worked supernaturally and people believed God? Think of the Reformation, of the great revivals in England and Scotland, Ireland and Wales. What about the Puritan revivals in the Great Awakening in America or the Second Awakening or the revivals in the southern states near the end of the Civil War? God has done great things. Faith has done mighty acts. We must tell of His wonders. Speak of them in the streets. Teach them to our children. We must not let them be forgotten. For the mighty hand of the Lord has done marvelous things through the faith of His people. You will notice that whenever mighty acts of God were done in old times, there has been someone or some group who had tremendous faith. So I ask the question, how great is your faith? Do you believe at this moment that if God willed it, every soul in Temple, Temple, Texas, could be converted even now? Do you believe that 
He will have mercy on whom He will have mercy. That God will do as He pleases and no one can stop Him. Well, you might say, well, I I know God can do anything, but I do not expect Him to do it in our time. I mean, we live in an information age, and anyway, the Lord might be returning soon. No, I don't expect revival. Then, brothers and sisters, you will not be disappointed, for you will not see revival or God work mighty acts because those and only those who expect them will see them. People of great faith do great things. Whenever there's been a revival, there's been a great interest in the Bible and believing it to be God's word. You see, revival is nothing more than re-Bible. With faith always comes mighty prayer. All the mighty works of God have been attended by great prayer. When men and women begin to pray individually and collectively in small groups and in large groups, and when they bombard the throne of grace, God works supernaturally. Mighty acts of God are seen by people who believe in revival. The great push of our lives and their lives was to see sinners converted and the great commission fulfilled. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Oh, God can bring us revival again and He will do so when He pleases. We must believe God for what seems to be humanly impossible. God's arm is not shortened that he cannot save, nor his ear so heavy that he cannot hear. Let me sum up this section with just four quick applications. I can't expand on these, but I encourage you to think about how they apply more extensively to your life. The first one is this. Faith is ready to sacrifice present comfort for future reward with Christ. See, faith recognizes that this life is very short in comparison to eternity. I mean, with Paul, faith recognizes that momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. (laughs) In Paul's case, this light affliction included beatings, imprisonment, being stoned, shipwrecked, and often being in danger of death. When you experience light affliction, Do you grumble or do you joyfully trust God? Secondly, I would say faith lives with a Godward focus, not a focus on people or things. See, the saints mentioned in our text could endure mockings and scourgings and and imprisonments and death because their focus was on God, not on other people or not on things. They were looking to eternity, not to this vapor of life here. I mean, John Calvin put it this way. He said, we ought to live only so as to live to God. As soon as we are not permitted to live to God, we ought willingly and not reluctantly to meet death. Thirdly, faith trusts and obeys God, leaving the results to his sovereignty. Some trust and obey God, and He grants spectacular results. Others trust and obey the same mighty God, and He enables them to endure horrific trials in His strength. The difference is not in the people or in their faith, but in God's sovereign purpose in each situation. We know the same God that these Old Testament saints knew. And we have even more in that we know Christ personally. So we should trust him as they did, whether he chooses to put us to death or he did as with the apostle James or to deliver us from death for a while as he did with Peter. Lastly, I would say faithfulness to Jesus Christ counts more than anything else, even than life itself. As Martin Luther put it, In a mighty fortress is our God. He said, let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, 
God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Trust God in whatever difficult situations you face because one day soon you will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. I want to thank you so much for tuning in. We will continue our study next week in Hebrews chapter 12. Moving on. (laughs) So until then, I hope that you stay safe and enjoy God's creation. Our God is an awesome God and worthy of our praise. I hope to see you soon. This is Ridge Adams from Memorial Baptist Church in Temple, Texas. May God bless you as you continue to seek His face.